Paul Cadlina, Craig Smoke, and joined by the Athletic Scott Doctorman uh, here with us on the show. And Scott, um, Kirk Ferentz, um, I know like no coach is pure as the driven snow, but he's not a guy who's had to deal with a lot of you know, NCAA violations in his career. So I guess it it caught a lot of people off guard that he's going to be suspended for this game for this portal uh, recruiting violation with with Cade McNamara. And I know they've reported one about Caden Proctor as well. How did this all kind of come about and and what mistake did he make? Yeah, looking back at the recruitment of Cade McNamara in December of 2022, I mean, it was pretty obvious that Cade was going to hit the portal. And there, it was also very obvious at that point that Iowa needed a quarterback. And he had some pre-existing relationships with members of Iowa staff, John Budmeyer, who also will be suspended for the opening game. Uh, he was an analyst, and now he's the wide receivers coach. John Budmeyer previously recruited Cade McNamara, or tried to, in, at Wisconsin, provided with one of his first offers. So they had a really good relationship in the beginning. And then there are a few other people that are kind of crossed over uh, both Iowa and Michigan at that point. So Cade McNamara officially entered the portal the first possible day, which was November 28th. And then he ended up uh, coming to or committing to Iowa on December 1st of that year, 2022. The one challenge that they did, they, you know, either discussed it with him or talked to him before he actually entered the portal. And as we know, that is a violation, a pretty serious one. And, uh, you know, jumping the portal basically. And, uh, you know, so it's impermissible contact. And after it was uh, the NCAA contacted Iowa to let them know that they were investigating. And I believe it's been several months in advance and probably is going as far back as January, if not more, Um, whether or not anybody turned them in, it's debatable. I know Kate has kind of spoken about the recruiting process. I think in in fact, his very first, um, discussion about that was with his former quarterback coach Jordan Palmer on his podcast and I think he kind of referenced that maybe Iowa did a, mention some things early and uh, that's really the crux of this whole thing so Kirk Ferentz took ownership of it he didn't try to fight it didn't try to say it was only a cheeseburger or anything like that he, <laughs> he, he swallowed this whole thing and uh, he'll be he'll be the first time since 1998 Iowa will not have Kirk Ferentz on the sidelines for a football game. What happens if they score like 57 points on offense in this game, Scott? Well, they probably will. (laughs) Um, You know, they did score 41 in a game last year, and and they're playing an FCS team who is – it's a good FCS team, but but it's an FCS team nevertheless. So I expect them to score some points, and and I'm sure that will be the the laughing uh, mention for, you know, for everybody here locally and also nationally. It's like, yeah, once they got Kirk Ferentz out of there, they're, you know, they're scoring. But obviously the following week against Iowa State will be the bigger litmus test when it comes to their offense. Scott, um, what is the difference in their offense from where it was? Because Kirk Ferentz isn't going to just all of a sudden install, you know, a Mike Leach offense uh, there just because that might be what his, his fans want. Yeah, it's, it's different. I mean, it's probably more like what you see with the you know, Los Angeles Rams, San Francisco 49ers, a Shanahan style of offense because it still relies heavily on the running game. It's still physical and, and zone scheme. But there's just a lot more motion and a lot more movement. And I would say the passing part of it is now, you know, based from, you know, where it was, which is like 1970s to now modern era uh, passing scheme. So that that's really the changes. I mean, I imagine that the uh, ratio between run pass will be really comparable. They'll probably try to be more in the 50-50 range. But there's a lot more motion in pre-stamp. And one of the problems that they faced uh, the last few years has been that kind of almost the outlawing of cut blocking and the, the zone scheme that Iowa employs and has employed really is reliant upon that. And even when they're executing a perfectly block, a perfect block, it gets called. And so they're going to, they've really had to peel that off and they haven't been able to counter off that. Well, the motions do a better job of that. So that's the expectation here that, that uh, with more motion um, that that will help loosen that up. They'll be able to run the ball better and then, you know, the, the, the scheme and, and the style and, 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 and some of the routes and the, the route concepts, I think, will be much better on offense. Scott, you've been covering the game for a long time. Uh, there's so much change uh, that's occurred over just the last year alone. What is your excitement level for this 
brand new era that seemingly is beginning uh, starting tomorrow, really, of the the open, expanded playoff era, the NIL out there in the open era. Uh, it's just it's a whole different world from even where it was a couple years ago. Uh, but it seems exciting uh, to me, at least. Uh, where, are your, where are your stances? And not to mention, like, Iowa's welcoming in some new teams into the Big Ten. Yeah, I think I'm, I am pretty excited for this because, you know, as much as I love the, the past eras, you know, the bowl games, the pageantry of those and everything, I think right now what we're looking for is, is a new era regarding the playoff. And it gives more teams more of an opportunity to compete for the real prize late in the season. And, and yes, you're not going to get that good feeling after a bowl win if you, say, you make it to the, the quarterfinals and you lose, but making it in the tournament is going to be the, the paramount for every program in the country. And it does provide some separation and they're, that the bowl games are going to have to figure out, especially that next tier, the Alamo Bowl, the Citrus Bowl, the bowl formerly known as the Outback. You know, Some of those higher-end bowls are going to really have to figure out what, how to make those games matter to people who are, just had their hopes dashed of going to the playoff. But I really like the fact that you go down the line, there's going to be games that matter. I mean, I look at, you know, in the state of Iowa on Thanksgiving weekend, you've got Nebraska at Iowa on, on Black Friday night, and then the next day you've got Kansas State at Iowa State. And those two games have the opportunity to, to have major playoff implications, um, you know, whether it's for the Big 12 championship spot for the Kansas State-Iowa State winner or one of the two teams. And then likewise, you know, perhaps Iowa and, and Nebraska, there's kind of a belief that Nebraska might be uh, on the rebound. If Iowa, say, 10-1 and one going into that game, there's going to be a lot of people around the country watching that from their own perspective. Maybe they don't want Iowa to win because it hurts their chances of getting in the tournament. Or, or likewise, the Big Ten, maybe they do. And then, you know, and then maybe Nebraska might knock them off. So I, I think this season will be much more interesting from start to finish than maybe we've seen um, ever before. Scott, um, I've seen you're a draft nerd like I'm a draft nerd, uh, and I've seen mock drafts coming out before the season. How early do you get started on your – do you dive into your draft nerdiness? I'm actually embarrassed to say that Nick Bumgarner and I are actually put, had just did our draft yesterday, <laughs> and, we've, and we've got one coming out next week, <laughs> which is <laughs> – the way 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 too early one so i've got the i have the even number of teams we have the odd number of teams so we did yeah we actually did that yesterday so <laughs> how close but i do think that it's a good exercise to do for someone who follows it uh, how close do you get do you think year to like year to year on what you start now and where it winds up oh man it's it, uh, you're lucky to get half, half the players even in the first round let alone mm-hmm. where they're gonna go and who's gonna because every t- every year there's a team that you think, man, this team's going to struggle to win, you know, two or three games in the NFL, and then all of a sudden they win seven, and you're like, wow, how did that happen? And then there's somebody who had a bunch of injuries and they fall, and so that just changes the whole dynamic of <laughs> what has, happens with your draft. But I, I do kind of figure if you can sketch out who are the, you know, right now my interest is who are the better teams in college fo- or better players in college football? Who are the players that we need to watch this coming year at what positions? And then you look at the NFL conversely and you say, okay, what are the, what are the positions that these teams still kind of need? And, and it's not just a, a plug and play, you know, one year deal for $5 million at corner, but you know, they need a starter for, you know, the next five to eight years. And I, I think that's a good exercise to do it that way. Every, you know, most people will scoff, but they'll still read it. <laughs> but it is kind of fun. Scott Doctorman of the Athletic. Scott, thanks for hopping on every time you do. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, there we go. Scott Doctorman.